show my screen. Okay. Oh, yeah, then uh, I'll show my screen. And then, uh, like, minimize this, I guess. The left arrow. Sorry. The red left arrow. Right there, yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so um, we're going to talk today about bioinformatics, and this is a huge topic. So um, I actually tried to do it in one week, uh, sorry, in one day. So, um, and, and we quickly realized that it's impossible to cover all bioinformatics in one day. So I decided to split it up into two parts. So we'll first talk about the principles of bioinformatics, and then um, we'll talk about specific applications uh, and how they relate to laboratory medicine and microbiology. All right. Um, I just want to start by saying, asking, like, how much experience do you have with bioinformatics as it relates as it relates to, say, proteomics, genomics, sequencing analysis, or statistical analysis. No, no, okay, okay. So, so the focus says, now typically bioinformatics is a really wide topic, and if you actually define it, um, oh, actually also, before I get started, I have a list of a little quiz there, so <laughs> what, 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 what you can do is um, you can actually maybe jot down answers as, as, they, as they appear, um, and then we'll, what we'll do is we'll review the quiz maybe tomorrow, um, just before we go over applications, because the application section is much shorter. On Wednesday. Um, on Wednesday, yes, okay. So we'll start out with some definitions. What does bioinformatics mean? How does it apply to laboratory medicine? We'll go into some of the technologies uh, used to develop the data from which you do the bioinformatics analysis. So we'll go over microarrays. We'll go over sequencing, which is a big component of it. And we'll also go over a little bit of mass spec. Okay? Um, and then we'll go into like data management and sequence analysis. Because much of the focus, bioinformatics actually has now become synonymous with sequencing analysis. And to some extent, that's that's, pretty, that's valid in the sense that uh, most, when most people think of bioinformatics in the setting of laboratory medicine, they think of you know, analyzing sequence of DNA sequence data. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about like, how would you, you would do you know, data ma management analysis of sequence data, a quick look at GenBank and Entrez. Um, have you used GenBank before? So No? Okay. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll go over that from the very beginning. We'll talk a little about similarity searching, which is one of the main applications. And what, I, what, I'm try, what I'll try to do is I'll try to focus specifically on how it might apply to either kind of the course of your work or, the, or, or your research, uh, because certainly you're, you're going to start seeing bioinformatics tools be developed as clinical assays. And uh, so, for instance, someone comes, uh, you know, basically an oncologist comes to you and says he wants to order, you know, he wants to order, say, whole genome sequencing of a lymphoma. And and he gets all this, and you get all this data back. So you, you'll, you 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 even though you may not be directly involved in doing bioinformatics analysis, uh, you'll have to actually provide some guidance as to kind of what test is, is informative, how are you going to apply these tests, um, and also kind of what tests to order. Um, so so we'll go a little bit into kind of the tools that we use, the basic tools that we use to do analysis, and that includes multiple sequence alignment, assembly, and phylogenetic analysis. And then finally, we'll talk about specifically about this. Uh, phenomenon of, of next generation sequencing. Uh, for those that are unaware of it, 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 basically, it basically is the uh, kind of successor to Sanger sequencing, or conventional Sanger sequencing, where it, it really involves the use of technologies to generate hundreds of thousands to millions of sequences. And, and how would you that, interpret that has, has become a big challenge. How do you actually analyze and interpret the data that you're generating? Okay. So we'll go over some two definitions. One is that when you describe biocomputing or computational biology, that's a catch-all term. It basically they describe the use of computers or computational techniques to analyze any type of biological system. Um, when you talk about bioinformatics specifically, it's the use of these same computational techniques to analyze, access, and interpret biological information in databases. Sequence analysis is a study of molecular sequence data, whether it's DNA sequence, uh, or protein sequence for the purpose of inferring the function, interactions, evolution, or structure of biological molecules. And then genomics refers to the analysis of genes or complete genomes within the same or across different genomes. And then proteomics is a subdivision where it's just concerned with looking at the protein or the proteome. Okay? Um, I would say that genomics is probably more advanced than proteomics. Uh, proteomics is like the next level, and they're, they're actually um, some some companies are actually starting to develop what they call like whole proteome type sequencers. Right now, we have essentially deep sequences for genomics. We really have nothing that's analogous to proteomics. Although um, there's a lot of interest in the development of essentially a mass protein sequence. Um, right now, the only tool that we do have is mass spec, which actually is not a high throughput method. Okay. Um, so when we talk about microarrays, I, I just want to give you kind of the biochip as an example. 
example, because that's that, this is a <coughs> kind of a classical kind of array that we use for like pan pathogen or pan viral detection in, in laboratory UCSF. It was originally designed in laboratories of Joseph Reese and Don Ganim. Uh, Joe DeRisi used to be a postdoc in, in uh, Pat Brown's lab at Stanford. Pat Brown is considered the father of microarrays. He actually invented microarray technology. Um, and the idea behind microarrays is, is you simply basically deposit spots of DNA, and the DNA essentially are considered probes. And these probes, based on the pattern of probes that light up when you um, label your specimen and put it on the, uh, the array, you can then kind of interpret, uh, kind of it generates essentially a pattern or a signature that you can then interpret. Um, so the viral chip was specifically designed using probes derived from all viruses. So it was meant as a viral detection type of device. So you could, based on the pattern of probes that light up, you could then kind of determine what virus was in your clinical sample once you label and put in, and hybridize to the array. Um, we have used it to discover novel viruses uh, because most novel viruses retain some sequence homology to known viruses. So for instance, SARS coronavirus was used to um, it was, it was used to detect SARS coronavirus because it hybridized to a subset of coronavirus probes from the spike protein that were highly conserved. Similarly, we've used it to identify other cardioviruses, eczema, uh, other viruses including eczema V, an avian bornavirus, and a cardiovirus in, in human samples. Um, and also we've done some work comparing it to uh, PCR, showing that it has pretty good sensitivity and specificity. Um, one thing is that um, the uh, this type of assay is, is kind of useless unless you have a quick and easy method of analyzing it. Uh, so traditionally, the, uh, the tried and true method of analyzing has been kind of hierarchical cluster analysis. And uh, it's also called cluster analysis in short. And what cluster analysis is, it basically, if you might imagine that you have a pattern of probes. Um, so what, what it does is, it, in unbiased fashion, it clusters kind of the probes with the arrays. See, the idea is if you have a set of arrays, it can look for certain patterns that are in common. So a good example would be, um, uh, kind of a traditional gene expression analysis. So let's say you take, uh, say, say, uh, let's say you take some cells that you added interferon and cells that are controlled, which you added nothing. Um, you know, the cells that you added interferon, they may have some probes that may selectively light up. I mean, those might be interferon response genes, for instance. So you'll see a pattern on the cluster. It actually looks like a cluster. Um, so to give you an example, like this right here is a cluster of red here where basically this, uh, in the x-axis are arrays and the right axis are probes, where you basically see that these probes are kind of light up corresponding to these particular arrays. So you might imagine that this might be a subset of arrays that would, there's experimental arrays that you applied interferon to, or in a setting of this, this, this actually may be a subset of arrays that have, that are that in, for patients with influenza and they control patients without influenza. And these probes might be, for instance, either interferon response genes in the first example or uh, influenza specific uh, genes in the, in the second example where they cluster together. Okay, now this is actually really useful in the research setting. Um, it's not that useful uh, basically clinically because I mean it's, you can't expect <laughs> uh, a laboratory or clinician to like analyze these, these arrays. So, so what, what we've done is and, and other and there are other methods of develop what we call automated uh, prediction. So the idea is you that you basically look for viral signatures. Uh, using a tool, using various tools. So we built this tool called ePredict. And the idea behind it is, um, because the viral chip was designed as a viral detection array, you can imagine that you can take every sequence, every viral sequence in GenBank, align it to all of the probes on the array, and you'll generate profiles or signatures, one for every virus. So there are about 2,000 viruses in GenBank, so you have the 2,000 signatures. You can then look at your actual data, let's say it's a clinical sample, a nasal swab. Um, it generates its own pattern, you can then compare it and then rank what virus is likely to be in your sample. So an example is something like this, where essentially this is sort of a, a composite of, of, of the results that you get from microanalysis for ePredict. So these are two examples. These are two samples from patients um, who had uh, kind of an acute hemorrhagic fever um, in, from India. So one patient, as you can see, had chikungunya virus, and one had dengue virus type 1. Interestingly, this was the array was able to set, distinguish between type 1 and type 2. You can see that there's really significant value p-value corresponds to type 1. This patient indeed has type 1 infection. Um, this, these are patients oops, <laughs> who had basically um, hepatitis A and B um, and patients with acute liver failure here at UCSF, where you can identify hepatitis A and B. Okay. This is an example of where it was used to detect a uh, novel virus. This is actually pandemic influenza H1N1. This is a signature for it, where you see that the closest hit, this is before we actually had um, sequence information for H1N1. This was in 2009. 
um, where um, the closest hit is in the swine strain of the H1N1 lineage of influenza A that was sequenced in 1998 from Wisconsin from a pig. So you see here that this would be where you could use it potentially to identify novel viruses um, uh, based on the uh, patterns that you see on microanalysis. Okay. Um, the other aspect of microanalysis is in design. So I want to quickly go over exactly how, how do we actually design these arrays and how do we actually select probes. Because part of the probe design will help you in terms of interpreting what it is, uh, the, uh, the results. So this is, a, this is an example of the HIV phylogeny. Uh, you see here that it's the, the, the um, do you know the most common HIV subtype? Does anyone know in North America? So all HIV-1 strains in the U.S. predominantly group M. Do uh, you know which one's most common here? A? It's actually B. It's actually B. B is 98% of all HIV in, in North America. Now, if you go to Africa, you will see actually all of these, unfortunately. And in fact, actually, it turns out that A is more common in Asia, so like in Thailand. Um, but uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to do with this, we wanted to use it in a microarray that could you identify all of the strains of HIV that are circulating. And in particular, it's important to, this would be an important tool that you might use, say, in Cameroon or in Tanzania, where there's a high diversity of HIV. Uh, there are even these uh, HIV strains called CRFs, called circulating combinant forms, which are essentially uh, kind of essentially recombinants of these various subtypes of HIV. So if you might imagine, if you want a good array, you want to have probes that are very specific as well as probes that are conserved and, and broad. Yes. Just out of curiosity, those recombinant forms, mm -hmm. do you get those when someone is co-infected by two different strains, or how do those? It's thought that they do, a, they, it's, it is thought that they originate from, uh, from co-infections, co -infections, which are actually quite common in, uh, in areas like Africa, where uh, in, in regions of our world, such as Africa, where the, where, the, where the prevalence of HIV is very high. Not as common here. We actually don't see it um, as, as often here. But yeah, it's, it is thought they do originate from, from, because these are essentially, they're not, um, uh, they're not, say, they're not, say, like hybrids of these two. They're, they're literally recombinant. So you have, may have, like, the M gene from B and, like, the, uh, the GAG from G, for instance. So, so these, are, these are true CRFs, they show, basically, that tend to propagate. Uh, and, in fact, it's, um, it, it, it is sort of interesting that they have, they have managed to use the CRFs to actually track kind of the evolution of HIV and how it spread through the world, basically. Um, in, in some cases, like, uh, they use CRFs to kind of determine kind of exactly how populations have kind of mixed together, which is, which is actually quite interesting, so that data is done like that. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not, this is, they're different than, say, kind of natural variation or quasi-species variation in HIV. So like any one strain, like HIV1 group M subtype B, which is the most common strain in North America, can have a significant degree of individual var variation with individual. That's just due to that strain. So it's not too recombinant. Okay. Um, I think you could think of it similarly to how you might think of influenza, where you have kind of shift, genetic shift and genetic drift, where shift is actually kind of reassortment of segments and drift is mutation, so a point mutation. So, so this is, uh, these are what we call specific probes. So you see here that these probes are very specific just for this one type of HIV, this one uh, type of HIV here, or SIV in this case. Um, and this is all, these, this set of probes is very specific for this one genome here. On the other hand, you may also want to have conserved probes. So these are probes right here, or probes are also called oligos or oligonucleotides, where these probes are, because they light up all, across all the genomes, these are highly conserved probes. So in principle, these probes could pick up any of these genomes because they uh, tend to light up the, uh, uh, they all light up regardless of what particular genome you might have. And these are obviously designed off of highly conserved regions, okay. Um, We've also used it to like uh, identify the uh, influenza. So you may imagine a similar thing you might do to HIV. If you can identify HIV, can you also design probes to identify and subtype influenza? So here's an example where we managed to basically subtype all of the known human avian strains of influenza with uh, pretty good accuracy and also able to identify kind of variant strains as well. Okay. So I want to okay. So I want to go into sequencing because that's been a big part of bioinformatics. Okay. So the general idea is that you would deep sequencing, you join hundreds of thousands to millions of sequences per run. And it depends on the technology. Now, the two most important parameters with respect to sequences are what they call read length, the length of each individual sequence and read throughput, how many sequences do you, do you generate. So to give you an idea, like on the Illumina instrument, which is a comment shown here, uh, an Illumina instrument, you can generate now about 100 base pair uh, sequences. So 100 bases in length, and you can generate about a run, maybe up to a billion sequences. 
So the throughput is a billion, the length is 100 base pairs. Um, and, you know, they're, they're basically a lot of second-generation instruments, but the only ones that we commonly see in kind of clinical labs, labs now it has been the 454 pyro sequencer. There's some clinical assays that have been developed off of it, and the Lumen Genetic Analyzer, although there are other technologies as well. Um, one big issue has been costs. Like a, a whole Lumina run costs about $20,000. So the issue has been that to save on costs, you might envision multiplexing clinical samples. So, so some people have put in, you know, tens to hundreds of clinical samples per run, and then the cost gets down to something that's competitive with other kind of assays you might use clinically. Um, but one big issue has been that there's no software for this. And as a result, it's required development of essentially completely new uh, specimen preparation protocols and new ways to analyze the, the, uh, the data. Um, in addition, there's a lot of interest now because there have been these third-generation technologies that have developed. So this includes um, an Illumina MySeq. I have one in my lab. It's actually in the Clin lab, in the micro lab. So if you want to come up to the database, I can, I can show it to you. But the idea is that you can go from a sample to an answer in about 24 hours. You can generate about 10 to 20 million sequences. Um, they're actually upgrading that instrument as well. So, so hopefully we'll be able to generate up to 50 million sequences within 24 hours. So it gives you a huge amount of capacity. And with uh, 50 million sequences, um, it's, it's, you can sequence the human genome. It's, a, it's only about 10 times redundancy, so you're not going to get great redundancy. You'll have to do like a couple of these runs to really sequence the human genome. But, but it's, it's to the point where you could start envisioning that you might uh, have some very interesting kind of uh, clinical tests that may, that may be developed using this technology. Uh, there's another competing technology called Iron Torrent, and I'm mentioning it because you probably, has anyone heard of it? Or not, not really. And what's nice about this instrument is it's a, it's a fifty thousand dollar instrument, so it's really kind of cheap by laboratory standards, and it can also generate roughly the same number of sequences, hundred base pairs, as the Illumina. So the idea has been, uh, well, what's nice about the Iron Torrent is that, um, in theory, you can actually go from sample to sequencing in about six hours. So n now you're starting to get where you get to the time frame where you could start uh, envisioning that again that you might that there may be clinical assays over the next couple of years. Um, Pacific Biosciences is another kind of interesting technology. It has the advantage that it actually generates reads up to like 1 kb long. So essentially the reads that it generates are, are equivalent to Sanger sequencing. Uh, the big problem with this machine is, one is that it's half a million dollars, but the other problem with the machine is that it's, uh, it's also the size of, a, of, a, of this room, there were half of this room. So it's not really that practical actually for, for clinical purposes. And then you have the 454 Junior, um, which is um, also a portable instrument. It doesn't really have quite the throughput, but for laboratories that are currently doing 454 Roche pyro sequencing, this, the junior is kind of a handy complement since it's really the same technology. Okay. Um, and so this gives you a little bit of summary of it. Um, I would say that the one, aside from the ones I've mentioned, solid and helicos are pretty much dead technologies. And the reason they're dead is that um, the, the sequence lengths are still remain very short, and they haven't found a, a good way to increase sequence length. So read lengths are turn out to be really important because they help in the assembly, they help in identifying reads, and they help in, in doing um, in kind of resequencing human genomes and things like that. So, so because the read lengths haven't really caught up, these two are basically companies that may um, you know go out of business. Basically, well, Sol is actually owned by ABI, I think. Um, Helicos is a separate company that, but, but I think that their technologies are, are sort of um, um, kind of falling by the wayside. Okay. There's another new technology they should be aware of. It's called Oxford Nanopore. Um, it's actually made by a group in England. Um, they actually don't actually have the instrument out yet, but what's nice about them is that they have, apparently have a claim that they have a sequencing that you could actually put on a USB stick. So the idea is that you could actually do sequencing, generate your data, and, and have it all done with a, with a portable USB stick. And you know, the idea would be that you could pull it out, you know, attach to your computer, and have it immediately analyzed, basically. So, so because of the portability, it's, it's become attractive, although we still haven't seen the instrument yet based on their technology. Okay. One of the big issues has been analysis, and that's why we're going to when we talk about bioinformatics. The big issue here is that um, you, you see here that this is the rate of DNA sequencing over time. And what's interesting to me um, is that this is actually an exponential curve that's on a logarithmic scale. Okay, if you look here, so if you look here at the rate at which deep sequencing is, is increasing um, and the capacity and the costs are decreasing, is outstripping Moore's law, which is the ability to actually analyze the data. So how do you actually deal with this issue? Um, we'll go into that um, some applications uh, probably tomorrow. Okay, but I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the tools that we use to start analyzing this data. Um, we'll go briefly to proteomics. Okay, so proteomics, uh, there are two types. One is that pretty much all proteomics now, which is the 
analysis of proteins um, is based on mass spec, because that's really the technology that we use to identify proteins or to sequence proteins. Um, there are two type of strategies. One's called the top-down strategy, and the other is bottom-up strategy. So the top-down strategy, uh, actually, we'll start with the bottom-up. The bottom-up strategy, actually, is where you use common standard methods like 2D gels or uh, gel electrophoresis to kind of separate and identify different proteins, and then use mass spec to, uh, to identify individual proteins. Okay. Now, the, the top-down is more of a um, kind of global strategy where you take your unknown sample, you fractionate it into individual peptides, and you identify each of the fractions. Okay. Does that make sense? Basically, so, so one, you actually purify the proteins in advance. In the second, you just take your whole gamish, sort of like a, you, you cleave them, you fractionate them, and then you individually sequence them. Okay. Um, and so for the, for the bottom-up strategy where you're kind of separating things, there are various ways to kind of purify and separate proteins. So you can put up the purification columns, shown as one for chitin. You can do gel electrophoresis. Um, you can do fractionation. Um, and then you can identify them using MALDI mass spec. Um, it, there's a tandem mode which allows you essentially to start sequencing. You can actually sequence them on the machine. Okay. Has anyone used mass spec or spec yeah. those you have? Okay, okay. So you're pretty well aware of this basic. So the so the, one of the disadvantages though with mass spec is that you can't sequence long stretches. As you know, you pretty much can only. The idea is that you you want to sequence essentially. Um, you want you can only sequence like 10 to 15 kind of amino acid length peptides. And the reason you, you can do so is because um, there's a date, there's basically you can look at the patterns and the patterns themselves will are, are characteristic for short stretches of sequence. And the idea is that you could take these 10 to 15 length amino acid stretches and then assemble them together to generate longer sequences. Now in, in theory this is quite attractive because you could use this to, to, to assemble proteins of any length. Um, in practice it becomes impractical once you get beyond say um, 80 to 100. Um, yeah, so, so it's really more useful for identifying like uh, short peptides than it really is for identifying full proteins. Although it has been used in the past to identify specific proteins. Um, so this gives you an example. Um, um, so basically after you fractionate the peptides, you can then individually identify the peptides and then assemble them uh, by uh, de novo assembly. Uh, this gives you an example where these are kind of, there's a, there are various programs that you can use. This is one called Mascot, which is an online program. You just submit the data, and it will output kind of the most likely protein based on kind of maximum likelihood methods. Um, this gives you an idea of, of kind of like how you would identify them. So, so, what, so the way it's identifying is you show, see shown here in red. In red are the actual amino acid sequences that were sequenced by the, that were, that were identified by the mass spec. So you see here that it, you can see that there really isn't that much there really isn't great coverage. It's only 46%. And yet, because of the, 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 uh, because of the specific pattern of those sequences, it was, um, you know, basically, um, there are automated programs that can immediately interpret what protein is most likely to be in your sample. So this is how it was able to identify, say, um, you know, that uh, cre uh, in this case, creatine kinase as the protein in your sample by mass spec with a pretty good, um, a pretty good significance, in this case, based on kind of the pattern of peptides. Any questions on that, or is that pretty self-explanatory? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about data management. Um, so one is that the big issue has been that the Human Genome and Human Microbiome Project and other related sequencing endeavors, they generate huge amounts of DNA sequence data. And it's, it's very promising because almost certainly it's going to lead to medical advances. But one big issue is analysis. Okay? And one, um, one major uh, problem is that you, what you want is you want it to be accessible to kind of not scientists who are not bioinformaticians. So especially, you know, clinicians who are going to have to interpret and the data, you want to make it ideally accessible by the Internet so it becomes widely and broadly accessible. And then you also want to make it public so that anyone can, in principle, can access the data. Um, so basically nowadays, sequences are stored in databases. So probably the one that you're probably most familiar with is uh, GenBank. Have you heard of GenBank, basically? That's the uh, database of the NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information. And that's kind of the main uh, resource that, that's used by institutions in North America. There are others that you probably should be aware of. Uh, well, the big one at uh, Europe is called the EMBL, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Um, they have their own system called Ecstasy for protein analysis. Um, and Swiss prot for amino acid sequence databases. Um, and there's also one in, in Asia, the, the big one is in Japan, it's called the DBBJ, okay, which is the DNA data bank. Uh, um, and then I've listed here more for, so, so this, these slides will be accessible to you, so I just list you just for your reference in case you do want to look. These are the common internet sites that use to access these sequence databases. Um, Genbank is 
a branch of the NCBI. It's a branch of the NIH. Um, that's kind of the NCBI website. And we actually go to the, um, oh, I should also mention one other thing is that there are also um, basically tools not only to looking at genes and genomes, but to actually look at um, patterns of protein expression or pathways. Okay, and that's actually, there are actually two major uh, resources. One's called KEG, which is the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, where you can actually look at, for instance, in this case, you, you're actually not only, not only able to look at specific genes, but you're actually able to look at kind of metabolic and regulatory pathways. And they actually can show you visually what, where does the gene apply based on the knowledge that's currently available, where, what, where does the gene apply in, in what particular pathway. Okay. So KEG is used commonly. Um, there's another... Um, Another analysis tool called Panther, basically, which is also similar, where you use it to kind of classify pathways, both metabolic and regulatory. Okay, um, this is NCBI. Um, has, have you guys looked at the NCBI website just to do similar researches or things like that in the past? Yeah. No. Okay. You have. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, but, but so so we'll go a little bit into uh, we'll go a little bit into like how you use Blast. So so this is when you, when you access GenBank, you'll see this. And then basically um, you see this uh, these headings on the top, PubMed, NTRES, blood. So PubMed is people commonly use because PubMed is where you can look up papers and things. So you, you can do a search for like authors and look up search for titles of papers. Um, NTRES, and we'll go into a little bit. BLAST allows you to do BLAST alignments of any particular sequences. And then you also have taxonomy and structure. Um, in addition to both DNA sequences, though, it's important to realize that GenBank is a huge resource. It has protein sequences, translated protein sequences, it has these things called ESTs. Um, have you heard of ESTs? Um, these, these are, so, so, so EXTs are essentially kind of, ESTs are short RNA fragments, or short fragments that haven't been really been annotated yet. So, um, and, and um, it used to be that, that ESTs just reported from a, where, where, you, where you have a genome, but the ge it hasn't been genome, it hasn't seen this, the genome is, where you have a, um, a cell line, or you have basically a tissue where the genome hasn't been sequenced yet. We, there are a lot of like genes that are like unknown or, or unknown function, so they're pretty much lumped into kind of the EST database. Okay, and and this is this is how now you might ask like why is it important or why is it important to even have ESTs in your database? Why why put in unannotated genes or presumably unannotated ORFs, open reading frames? And and the reason is because people have actually used this in the past to be able to to identify to use markers uh, without actually even knowing what the gene does or is. <laughs> And, and this is before we even had, like, the sequence of the human genome, for instance, where the majority of genes in the human genome were ESTs. Uh, you were still able to use kind of the ESTs to be able to identify, say, a subset of ESTs that are more common in cancer versus normal, fever versus non-fever. And you might imagine that you could, you could still design a test to separate them, like maybe a PCR for that EST, without actually even knowing what the gene does. Okay? You're using it more as a marker, basically. And that's still commonly used for genomes that have been sequenced. Now, uh, these databases, EST databases, are actually becoming less useful now simply because uh, we're sequencing so many more genomes. So there's less information that's not known or not annotated. Um, and then you have this, um, uh, they are, they're also separate single nucleotide polymorphisms or s and uh, They're also called SNVs or single nucleotide variants. And those are important because they enable you to look for, say, cancer mutations and other things. So there's specific databases that specifically look at these mutations. Um, there's another um, database of genetic disorders that focuses on specific gene changes or uh, gene rearrangements in genetic disorders called the OMIM. And there's also a short read archive, which you actually store the raw data in. So for instance, you generate data on Illumina, you can actually deposit it into the SRA to actually store that data. Um, annotation is really important because otherwise uh, you have no idea what the sequence corresponds to. So I just want to focus on, when you look at annotation for these various entries, um, you know, they all contain kind of these elements. Probably the, the key thing to focus on, I would say, beyond just the sequence itself would be the accession number. The accession number is invariant and it never changes. So, for instance, for the, the prototype influenza H1N1, 2009, the original uh, strain that was, that was sequenced in Mexico, that has a unique accession number. That accession number will never change. Now, on the other hand, let's assume that... Um, Let's assume that one year later, someone updates the sequence. Oh, I found a bug in my, an error in my sequence. I miss, I, you know, I want to add a few A's at the end. Well, you can change the sequence, but you can't change the accession number. Okay. Is that important? Uh, is there any questions on that? No? Okay. You can retire the accession number, though. You can remove the accession number if you feel that maybe this was kind of completely misannotated, uh, but you can't change it. Okay. Okay. Um, and so this is an example of, this is the influenza A 
H3N2, which is seasonal variation. This is the HA, or hemagglutinin gene. Um, so the parameters that you want to look at and as, you, as you deposit this, this data, so it has a unique accession number shown here. The accession number can have a version, so this is dot one. You can't change accession number, but you can add different versions. Um, this is also the corresponding, this is called the GI, which is also another way of uh, accessing the accession number. These don't really change. Then you have the source, which is a name here. Uh, you have the authors, you have a, a paper in the journal that, that the original sequence is published in. And then going down further, you'll you actually start seeing the different gene features and the, finally the sequence. Okay. Um, there are tools for finding sequences. One is called Entrez, which is, which is actually integrated or embedded in the GenBank. You can actually search for sequences using keywords, using sequences, using accession numbers. Uh, this is Entrez. Um, so essentially what you want to do, you can search different aspects of it. So let's say you want to look up the sequence of H1N1 influenza. Well, you, can, you basically select here. You say search, select nucleotide. Uh, you type in 2009 H1N1 HA, and it'll give you kind of all of the reads. You want to search for the protein sequence. You want to search for genomes. You want to search for taxonomy. You want to search for genetic uh, variation, uh, genetic mutations, et cetera. You can do that by entrance. Okay. Um, so I want to go through an example of it. Um, um, this is an example where um, you search nucleotide for BRI. BRI brings up um, essentially this. It brings up Kaposi sarcoma, BRI K1 protein, but then it also looks up musk mucus, the BRI gene, mRNA within mouse, homo sapiens, BRI, mRNA. As you can see, you get a big, a lot of like different types of hits, but that's because this is not specific enough. You can add kind of more, uh, you can, and there are also ways of, of putting limits to your searches, et cetera, and we're doing more advanced searches, okay? Um, it is completely cross-linked, so what's nice is that when you look up the DNA, you, uh, you can immediately look up the protein as well and vice versa. Um, so these are the cross-links. So let's say I look up the DNA for a sequence, a nucleotide sequence, but I can immediately access the genome it came from. In some cases, I can access the protein, corresponding protein sequence, and even in some cases, access the structure in PDD format. So you can actually look at the crystal structure if it's known of that particular protein, as well as Medline, which is a literature based on your sequence. Uh, okay, so similarity searching. Um, there are a variety of pro programs that have been used to basically make comparisons between DNA sequences. So what do you want to do? Well, you generate a lot of sequence data. One of the main purposes, one of the main functions of, of analyzing the data has, is to compare it to sequence databases. You want to know, for instance, uh, what sequences that you generate from a clinical sample, um, how do they relate to se known sequences in the database? Well, the most popular way that you use to actually compare these sequences is called BLAST. BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. Um, these are the various tools. So BLAST-N, as you might expect, the nucleotide BLAST. BLAST-P is a protein BLAST. BLAST-X is called a translated query versus protein BLAST. So what you do is you take your nucleotide DNA sequence, translate it in all six possible frames, both three and four, three reverse. Then you compare each of the translated sequences to a protein database. And then you can, now why is that important? Well, um, for us, where, um, like in my lab, we do like viral pathogen discovery. If you might imagine, you have a pathogen that's highly divergent. Well, by blast and by nucleotide blast, it may not align to anything. But when you actually translate it into the amino acid um, frame, well, then, then you might be able to identify, um, you know, because uh, amino acid sequences are more concerned than nucleotide sequences in general. So when you translate it, you then may be able to identify something that's more divergent. Okay. Um, and I'll give you some examples, like tomorrow, basically, and how we use it. The other thing is called tblastx, which is even more, even uh, crazier than blastx, is where you're not only translating the query, the, the input sequences, you're translating the actual database itself. So you're comparing a nucleotide sequence with a nucleotide database, but you're translating both the sequence and the database. Okay. And the, one of the dangers of something like tblastx is that one is that it takes forever. As you might imagine, because they, 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 their time goes up exponentially. The second problem is that you get a lot of false hits, as you might imagine. Because you might get, like, translations of regions that are introns that correspond to, like, non-coding regions. It becomes a, uh, it be, you do get a lot of false hits, so you have to be wary of TBLAST-X results. And finally, there's, a, there's another thing called FIBLAST. That looks for kind of short patterns of, of remote homology, and it allows you to identify things of remote or distant homology. Okay. Um, BLAST is free. You have an online versus standalone BLAST. If you have a server, you can install BLAST yourself, make it standalone, or you can just look it online. Let me give you an example of online. So this is the NCBI website. So basically what it is, you can select kind of the program you're using. BLAST N is a nucleotide alignment. NR is basically um, the NR database. Um, 
Now, the NR actually does typically refer to the protein database. So it means non-redundant protein database. If you see NT, that actually refers to the non-redundant nucleotide database. Okay? And these are very common databases because what essentially they are is they're essentially all curated, annotated protein sequences in GenBank that are not redundant are found in NR. All annotated, curated nucleotide sequences that are not redundant are found in NT. So this is why it's a quick, it's not, it's not a quick way, but it's a comprehensive way to identify what your sequence corresponds to. So let's say, uh, so what I would do is I would select last N here, I would select NT here, I would then input my um, database. Um, so, okay, I think I already went over this. So ESTs are the express sequence tag, they're unannotated. You have NR, which is non-reductive. Okay. Let me, okay, so let's talk a little bit about similarity searching, okay? So there are two things about, one is that you want to, it relies on two concepts. One is alignment and one's distance, okay? Um, now, distances, now if you align two sequences together, you calculate what would be the distance. My distance, in bioinformatics terminology, it basically means like how related is one, one aligned sequence with another. And you base it basically on the number of mismatches you have, the number of gaps you have in the alignment. And I'll give you some examples of that. And based on the distance, um, things that are, uh, the things that are uh, larger distances are less similar to each other. Okay? Shorter distances are more similar to each other. And by doing so, uh, with some other research, you're actually testing your alignment to every sequence in the database, and you're looking for the best, best matches. So let's say I have a, um, a sequence that I got from, say, an influenza sample. Okay? Let's say it happens to be from the HA gene. I then align it against every sequence, say, in NT. Well, if I want to do so, what it will do is what, what the program actually does is it actually takes that sequence, aligns it against everything in NT, and then it basically ranks based on the closest matches. So you might expect the number one match might be the HA gene from the very strain that you have from H1, H3N2. Now the second hit might be the HA gene from H1N1 because that's closely related. The third one might be bad influenza. The fourth one might be something that's not even another orthomixal virus, and et cetera. So, so you can kind of rank kind of hits. Um, so this is an example. This is basically GLASN using a PCR fragment from TAC polymerase where um, this is actually it's well known now that TAC polymerase is actually um, contaminated with kind of mouse retrovirus genes, unfortunately. So this is an example where you can see here the number one hit is to a mouse uh, retrovirus gag gene. Uh, you can see here where it's a beautiful hit, 99% identity. This is the E value. The E value is a measure of significance when, with the blast hit. The E value is 10 to the minus 102, so extremely significant. You can see here this is why. It has no gaps and has 99% identity. Okay. Um, now, BLAST also enables you to do automatic translation, and that's what it means with BLASTX, is that it will translate everything in six frames compared with Protein Database, or TBLASTX, as we discussed, much slower than BLAST10. Um, it also produces what we call an E-value. It's the same as the P-value in statistical tests, and E-value is considered significant. Typically, we use an E-value of 0.05, okay? Um, if, you really, if you really want significance, though, you can make it lower than that, you know, in some cases, 10 to the minus 8, et cetera. Um, very low E values. Actually, I'm sorry. This is not. This is actually not correct. It should be uh, 10 to the minus 5, not 0.05. Sorry. Uh, so E value 10 to the minus 5. Um, very low E values are considered essentially identical. Um, so this gives you another example. This is where this is actually on the website. Also NCBI. You take protein blast. So I the protein blast here. I input the sequence. This is the protein sequence that I inputted. I run, I make sure it's a BLAST P, so it's a protein protein BLAST, I then run BLAST. Uh, as you can see here, I get here a bunch of hits, and this is kind of the visualization you see on the website, uh, where um, these are the hits. So the hit, so this actually is a protein, which is an open reading frame from foul adenovirus. So the number one hit is an ore from foul, and you see kind of other hits are other from other strains of foul adenovirus. Uh, and then you get kind of weaker hits to other things, um, like, you know, this is a homo sapiens, pyrophosphatase, a DUTB5 phosphatase, which has also a pretty significant hit as well. Okay. Um, now, if you want to actually look at the hit, you can do so. So what this means is this is the number one hit. This is the accession number of the number one hit. This is the actual, uh, what they call the similarity score. The higher, the more similar. This is the corresponding E value, so the significance of the match. This is called query coverage, which means how much of the match was actually covered, um, how much of it was actually how much of the query of the input sequence was actually covered by the, by the match. Um, in this case, it's 100% across 100% of the genome. So it doesn't mean that's 100% match. It means it's 100% across the genome. Okay. 
Um, so if we go here, this happens to be 100% identity. So you can't really get any better than this. No gaps, 100% positive, 100% identity. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at some, some other gene, this is the uh, DUTP from, from Macaca mulata, which is a rhesus monkey. You'll see here that the hit is still very significant, but it's not as good. So this might be, say, a pyrophosphatase that's found in adenovirus or foul adenovirus that's only, um, uh, that, that may be weakly, weakly or less, less closely related to, say, uh, in this case, monkey pyrophosphatase. Okay. Um, okay, then basically the output looks like this, where you see the query sequence, the matching sequence, and then the actual database sequence. So the subject is the database, and query is the actual input query. Okay. So other tools that you can use, um, you can do a blast, you can use multi multiple sequence alignments are also commonly done using ClustLW and then kind of other tools and other pathways. Okay. Um, <coughs> the other thing that's interesting is that you can do like kind of a little more in, in NCBI. So this is where in NCBI you can not only like do, do queries to alignments, you actually look for variabilities among whole databases. So in this case, this is called uh, COG. COG is actually allows you to what happens is um, all of the genomes of NCBI have been essentially annotated because they've done what they call principal component analysis of the genomes. So for, and what they've done, they managed to cluster similar genomes together in what they call COGS or cluster or orthologous groups, okay? So you might imagine that you might have COGS corresponding to say, there, there for instance is one big COG corresponding to say all MRSA genomes that have been sequenced because they cluster tightly together. But you might also look at kind of relationships um, between various genomes in the database, so this is, and this shows you the significance of the, of the matches to various genomes. So using PCA, you can actually measure variability across whole genomes now. You could all, also do this at NCBI. Uh, this is CAG and Panther. These are where you can actually analyze pathways. So this is kind of, again, output that you actually see from one of these uh, websites. We can actually not only look for where your gene hits, but also see where does your gene fit within functional pathways. Okay. Uh, this is a homo sapiens. Okay. I want to uh, briefly go into phylogenetic analysis because that's really important. So the idea behind phylogenetic analysis is imagine you have a lot of sequence data. Well, what happens is you could basically generate what we call an evolutionary model based on differences within sequence data over time. And, and doing so, you can generate essentially evolutionary trees. Um, and this is, so what is basically a tree? It's a basically a connected graph consisting of various nodes where each of the nodes refers to a sequence and they have edges that, that connect each of the pair of nodes and then cycles, which is kind of edges that sort of return to the a path of edges that return to the site starting point. So for instance, this is basically, uh, so, so trees consist of graphs with edges but no cycles. So this is a tree because you have this node going down to this node and this, this node has two daughter nodes here. This is not a tree, this is a cycle because it connects back to the starting point. Okay. Um, so. Um, and so basically, anything can be expressed as trees. In fact, any set of objects can be analyzed for the relationships. So whether they're species, genes, or proteins. So, and we actually call this set of objects what we call operational taxonomic units, or OTUs. And you'll see that very commonly in phylogenetic analysis. Phylogeny is always based on differences between the OTUs. Uh, very commonly with sequence information, they're based on sequence differences. So uh, this gives you an idea. Um, this, these are OTUs. They're specific uh, short sequences that may be, uh, that may reflect the relationship between different species, okay? And this basically highlights, this is an example, this is basically a segment of various, uh, these are all kind of simian or human, ge uh, actually mammalian genomes, where you basically see within the stretch of DNA, corresponding DNA to these genomes, you see kind of all of these, uh, a few differences. But otherwise, they're very, very similar. And going from this sequence information, you can then generate a tree where the length of the branch is proportional to the number of differences. So the length of, the length of branches in phylogenetic trees is proportional really to the number of differences or the distance between the various sequences, okay? Um, so the branch length reflects the extent to which there's substitutions or differences per nucleotide site. The longer the branch, kind of the more difference or the more change there is between the sequences. Okay. So, um, let's, uh, so let's go into uh, kind of this relate. So this is how you might generate what we call a distance map, where you look here that if you compare, say, chimp and gorilla, there are five nucleotide differences. So you put five here. Chimp and human, there are only two nucleotide differences. So you put a two here, chimp and macaque, eight, et cetera. And you can actually generate, essentially, a um, kind of a distance. This is called a distance table, okay? Now, the big issue, though, is how do you go from a distance table to a phylogenetic tree? Has anyone done this before? 
Yes. Okay. So um, it's a um, so it's actually done. Well, before we go that, we'll, we'll show that you might imagine that you could use this as a way to look at evolution, right? Because as you see differences starting from AAG, ACTT, you can start seeing nucleotide changes that then involve the further nucleotide changes, and finally you see kind of daughters. So you can generate that. Now the big the big question though is right now we actually don't know. These are all hypothetical, all of the ancestral nodes. So the idea is from all of these sequences, from the sequences that we have today, can you go back to generate the tree and how the sequences evolved over time? And the way we do this is a method called, um, so this is called the phylogeny problem. How do you go from today, sequences today, to the original tree that was used to kind of generate the sequences? Okay. Um, so one idea is, is, is basically a brute force approach. So what you want to do is you want to gather the sequence data, multi, do multiple alignment in all the sequences, and reconstruct many, many trees. In fact, every possible tree that you can imagine. So that's what, now one big issue though is that um, this is very time consuming, okay? Um, so there are kind of ways to kind of statistical methods of, of making this faster, but as a result, you might end up with millions of trees, unfortunately. It takes a long time to do this. The other issue is that you have to actually figure out which trees are reliable, so there have to be kind of consensus methods to, during the set of trees to figure out which one actually uh, is reliable. Um, so one is based on a method called neighbor joining, uh, where what you do is you um, you generate what they what we call the distance table or distance matrix. You use neighbor joining, but if you want to pick, uh, you, the idea is that um, the differences that are the least, um, they should be closest together. So you use that, you basically combine the distances that are the closest first and then go out and then eventually expand out the distances that are that are um, that are more that are farther apart. Um, and uh, this method is called uh, the principle of maximum parsimony. Okay, so the idea is that by evolution, you might expect that you know nature takes the simplest route. So the idea is what you want to do is you want to do as, as few, generate a tree that has as few changes as possible. Okay, because uh, you know, and, and this is actually happens to be quite uh, quite reflective of the way kind of evolution actually works, where it simply takes kind of the simplest method. So what this is, is you can generate imagine what we call a maximum parsimony score which is basically the tree, a particular tree that has the fewest number of differences between nodes of the tree. So in this case, you have, for instance, um, you know, there's two, there's two changes as you go from GTA to ACA. So that's, this branch has a score of two. This has another two changes, score of two, and there's one change between here. So this has an MP score of five, okay? Now, if you have a tree like this, though, you might imagine that ACA going to GTT, well, the, all three nucleotide positions have to change. So this becomes 3, 3 plus 1 plus 7. And then this one, on the other hand, has MP score of 4. So, the idea, so it turns out that this tree is what they call optimal. Now, is, actually, is this tree actually, though, the real tree? In some cases, you might be wrong. Um, although, um, in, in, in general, usually by applying the principle of maximum parsimony, um, you actually generate the, the, the correct tree. And that's, this has actually been shown over and over again for in cases where we actually do know the evolution. Okay. Um, so that's called, uh, that's called NJ joining. This gives you an example of where I actually applied it. Uh, so we identified a new adenovirus called TT monkey adenovirus here. Um, so I basically took the whole genome, ran it, uh, ran through a maximum parsimony algorithm, and it placed it kind of outside here. So th this is where we immediately knew that this particular genome didn't fit in any of the traditional adenovirus groups. They, a through G of human and simian adenoviruses. So this give an example of how you would apply a tree. Okay. Um, so I want to um, actually I will actually end here because I because this is stuff that I'll go into tomorrow specifically of details on how you might do deep sequencing or sequence alignment. Okay. Um, any questions on the stuff that was done before? Because it's going to it's actually going to get more complicated because I'll be going into like global and I'll be going into like uh, the Smith Waterman algorithms and and things like that. So I don't know if you want to. Um, so, so if you have any questions, are there any questions on so far? Okay. Okay. Let me um, let's 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 maybe like briefly go up to like this quiz because um, I think it's pretty straightforward. So classical. So when, why don't we start? Jillian, do you want to start? What is the classical analysis method used to describe patterns in microarray data? Um. So sequencing. Um. That is not sequencing. The microarray data. Oh. Um. So it's just DNA probe. Analysis. Yes, and and what was the uh, the name of the analysis method that's used in research to uh, cluster analysis? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, cluster, cluster, yeah, good. Um, how about two applications of the biochip? Is anyone novel discovery? Okay, so one's discovery. What's the other? 
potential clinical diagnostics, yeah, and the last one would be would be uh, doing subtyping of HIV or flu or things like that. Um, how about next generation sequencing? Where the two most parameters that are most important in respect to reads: length and number of sequences. Yes, <laughs> length and throughput. Uh, name at least two third generation technologies: Torrent and the MySeq. Perfect. Um, in mass spec based proteomics, what's the difference between top down and bottom up? Top down, you fractionate first, and bottom up, you separate the proteins first. Perfect. Uh, what's the main public sequence database of the NIH? GenBank. GenBank. Perfect. <laughs> what does KEG stand for? Kyoto. <laughs> Encyclopedia. <laughs> I can't believe you actually remembered that. <laughs> it is the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. Perfect. What is this database used for? Uh, determining where a specific DNA sequence or gene is involved in regulatory or pathways. Perfect, biological pathways. So, so name another tool with a similar function. Panther. Basically the same as, yeah, Panther, perfect. Uh, what, and we'll go over the specific examples of that tomorrow. What does EST stand for? I, I, sort of like, I sort of like skip this really quickly. I, it actually stands for expressed sequence tags. It actually doesn't mean anything, really, but it's called expressed sequence tags. Um, and um, everyone knows it as EST, and, and basically they're just, um, as I mentioned, unannotated gene sequences, if you can think of it almost. Okay. Um, what is SNP, SNP, and SNV? You know, these are important. Single nucleotide polymorphism. Yes. And then SNV? Variant. Single nucleotide variants. Perfect. What are they? Usually, they're, aren't they just single base pair changes usually yeah. that don't actually... They're just single base pair changes, yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, you can call them single, you can call point mutations, some people call them, yeah. Although, they're, they're, strictly speaking, they're not really mutations, per se. They're just differences. They're actually variants. Because you're not actually mutating the genome. They're just differences that exist within... So do they... In order to yeah. be a SNP, do you can you do you have to be silent, or can you change the amino acid sequence? Uh, no, no. In fact, you can have both co what they call coding or non-coding SNPs. Right. So you can have silent ones and the ones that where you actually change the identity of the amino acid. Yeah, they, they're both considered SNPs. Yes. Yeah. What is the public uh, archive sponsored by NEH used for archival and storage of next generation sequencing data? I actually skipped by this pretty quickly. Where you can actually input raw deep sequencing data. That's called the yeah. SRA, so short read or sequence read archive, SRA. Um, what is the unique and constant data identifier corresponding to each entry called? Session. Session number, great. What is uh, the search and retrieval system called in the CDI? Entrez. Entrez. Perfect. Difference between BLAST and BLAST P, BLAST XT, BLAST X, by BLAST? Nucleotide protein translate is translating the sequence to a protein. Oh, you know, it's it's changing the it's going plus three. It's changing the reading frame, right? We're shifting the yeah. Well, it's translating in all reading frames. It's right, translating the query, frame, yeah, yeah. Um, and then comparing it to a protein database. And then tblast six is we're translating okay. your both of the, the database and the query. Yeah, five blasts is remote homology. Um, what's the abbreviation for the non-redundant protein database? NR. NR and non-redundant nucleotide database. NT. NT. Perfect. What is the analogous parameter to the p-value produced by BLAST output? E-value. The E-value. What value is considered significant? Minus 5. Yeah. 10 to the minus 5. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, what statistical analysis method uses the for variability across genome databases? So the principal component analysis, or PCA. Um, similar genomes are placing COGS. So what are COGS? <laughs> Cluster of... Cluster of oligous genes. Cluster of autologous genes. So you can just you can just think of them as, as almost like genes that are uh, genomes or genes that are similar to each other essentially. So you can think of Staph aureus cog. You can have you know Homo sapiens. Um, you know like cogs. Uh, for instance, they're cogs referring to all of the uh, uh, transmembrane proteins. They they form cogs because there are similarities between them. Um, in phylogenetic analysis, evolutionary relationships between any set of objects described in what units? called OTUs, or Operational Taxonomic Units. Um, the length of a branch is proportional to what in a typical tree? Nucleotide. Nucleotide differences, yep. Um, perfect. And the principal marks from parsimony we just went over. Um, so so you, want, you want something that has the least, uh, the, the lowest MP scores, maximum parsimony score. Okay. 
We'll go over the rest tomorrow. It's like a refund card. Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I guess we're not going to have a question for you. So, um, I think last time I mentioned that you know, we're 